Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Thomas Nierhaus. Uh, I'm working in France, uh, in Lyon. And together with uh, Adrien Dominguez, who cannot be here today, we developed this uh, uh, couple of uh, examples to use uh, excited states in DFDB+. So my talk will be about uh, the linear response, TDDFTD capability in DFD plus. Tomorrow there will be another uh, session on what we call real time TDDFTD. And uh, let me start by giving you a very general introduction about why uh, excited states are of interest in general. Uh, well, light matter interaction is important for all of us. Um, of course, in recent years, because we are more interested in photovoltaics, so solar cells. Um, so light is used to uh, excite an electron from an occupied to an unoccupied state. Um, and then you can separate electron and hole, you get the, the voltage difference which you can use. So that's the uh, principle of photovoltaics. But the opposite effect where uh, the electron and the hole can also meet to emit light is used in uh, light emitting diodes or in organic light emitting diodes like you have, for example, in a lot of smartphones. Um, in our eye, we have uh, proteins which undergo uh, conformation to change when you absorb light. And that, that leads to the process of vision. So that's in so called uh, rhodopsin family of proteins in, in the retina. And finally, you also can use uh, materials to store information about zeros and ones to, to have data storage. For example, you maybe don't remember these things. These are rewritable DVDs. And at that time, you were quoting information on these disks. Uh, and you could write with a laser and read out with a laser the information that you uh, imprinted, right? And the, the basic principle is that you go from an amorphous to a crystalline phase of some material by interaction with light. So all of this shows you that uh, um, it is of interest nowadays to, to study light matter interaction at the number scale because in all these different sorts of materials, you always have something that is uh, not quite a molecule, but not yet a full crystal, right? For example, when we think about this uh, this protein here in, in our in our retina, there is a molecule in the protein, but the the light response of the molecule is completely changed due to the environment of the protein. So the intermediate environment of the protein, the molecules that are around the molecule here are important. Um, for light emitting diodes, you have these transition metal complexes, which are quite large, I would say. Um, and then for photovoltaic cells, well, you have different sorts of photovoltaic cells, but one are these uh, disynthesized solar cells where this molecule is absorbing light, and then the electron is transported to a titanium oxide nanowire in this case. So it's not just the molecule, you also have to describe uh, the substrate. So that means that there is an interest in excited state methods that uh, can be used to describe systems larger than a simple molecule. And quite often they are not periodic, right? So you also don't have the simplification that you have periodicity in your system. So that's why uh, uh, why DFTD plus can be uh, of interest. So a, a couple of general remarks about uh, the interaction of light with matter. Uh, you all know uh, you can, uh, depending on the uh, energy of the incoming photon, you can excite different sorts of excitations in the system. You can have vibrations in the infrared, then uh, it's an energy scale of midi electron volt. Uh, visible and uh, ultraviolet is in the EV range, and that is the excitation of valence electrons of your system, or the other valence electrons in the periodic system as well. Uh, and then finally, you have X-ray excitation. Then you really probe the core electrons of your system. You have energies of kilo electron volt. So it all depends the interaction on the on the energy scale what you excite. And quite often we will be interested in this talk 
in this region over here, the visible and ultraviolet. One reason is, of course, that DFTB is uh, a valence electron method, right? So we don't have core electrons, so we cannot excite them, right? So that's why we are interested mostly in this, in this area. Now, what is determining whether or not your system absorbs light? At the end of the day, it's uh, the rate for this process is given by Fermi's golden rule, as you very likely know. Um, you have an initial state of your system, you have a final state of your system. The, the rate of going to this final state is the absolute value squared of this matrix element. And you have some energy conservation in the process. What's the perturbation? The perturbation is uh, for the interaction of light under the electric dipole approximation. It's simply uh, the dipole position operator at the end of the day that causes the transition. And then when we make a simple approximation, we can say uh, when we are, well, we are in the born Oppenheimer approximation. So we say the total wave function that depends on electron coordinates and nuclear coordinates, we can make it a product. So then we are in the one Oppenheimer approximation. Also, we are typically non-relativistic, assuming that we can, first of all, neglect any spin operator in the Hamiltonian. Then we can write the total wave function as a simple product of an electronic part, a spin part, and a part that depends on the nuclear coordinates. And then you'll see quite easily that this matrix element here, this operator, can be broken down into various parts. And this is um, a bit important for what's coming. Um, the transition rate from going from one state to another, at the end of the day, is given by these three different parts. There is one part, which is the overlap of the vibrational wave functions. That's what we call the frank Conten overlap. We have the overlap of the spin wave functions, the direct overlap. And that means you cannot go from a singlet state directly to a triplet state. Okay, so that transition is spin forbidden. You can go from a singlet state to a singlet state without problem, but singlet to triplet is forbidden. So that would be simply zero because the overlap of a singlet and a triplet uh, wave function is zero. And then we have another term here, and this is the most interesting term for us. It is um, what we call the transition dipole moment. So you go from an electronic state, let's say from a certain orbital to another orbital, and this transition uh, dipole moment of this integral tells you how strong the rate for this uh, transition is. It could be simply zero because the symmetry of the orbitals in the transition are such that the integral is zero. It could be also non-vanishing, then you have the transition, and the rate is proportional at the end of the day to this transition dipole uh, matrix element uh, squared. So when the, this is what we call the oscillator strength of the transition. So whenever this integral is large, you will have a tendency, a strong tendency to absorb towards this given electronic excited state. Some more words about the vibrational wave function. Uh, as I said, so in this product, you also have, in principle, to uh, look at the fact that you have a strong overlap of, so I should start in a different way. What you see here are the so-called potential energy surfaces of the excited state and the ground state. So this is a singlet state, typically your ground state is a singlet. Uh, and the excited state that we are looking at here is uh, also a singlet, right? And the energies of those states vary as a function of geometry. So you get this potential energy surface. You might have uh, an optimal geometry in the ground state that you get, for example, from a conventional TFT plus calculation. But it might be that the minimum in the excited state is at a different point, at a different geometry, okay? So what in absorption you have a process that can, for example, go from, 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 from this vibrational sublevel, because this is the electronic potential energy surface, and in this potential, you can have different quantum states representing the molecular vibrations or phonons, if you like. So you have quantization of the vibrations, 
And then the transition is from one of these sublevels to another sublevel. And what's important is the overlap of the vibrational wave function. And you see that uh, here, for example, there is a rather strong overlap of this level in the vibrational ground state of the ground electronic state towards maybe this level over here, which also has some important probability density at the end of the potential energy surface. So this transition might actually be quite favorable. Another transition from here to some other point might be less favorable. At the end of the day, you get an absorption spectrum which looks like this. I think many of you know this already. And this means that in, in general, an absorption spectrum of a molecular nanoscale system has in principle the substructure which comes from the phonons in your system. Quite often, if, especially if you are at higher temperature, this fine structure is not detectable, right? You can do it for very small molecules, but typically not for a big nano, nano system. Uh, so you average over this, right? And then you get a simple a big block. And then the typical approximation is that what your calculation gives you, and we'll see examples later, is the maximum of absorption, right? But that's an approximation. It's not, in principle, you always need to discuss also the phonons in your system. But typically, this is not done. And the approximation is that the, the, the result of your calculation corresponds to the maximum of absorption. Okay, so imagine that you would average here over, over the different peaks, right? Then you would get one band and the maximum would be somewhere here. Okay. Good, what happens after absorption? After absorption, if you go from the ground state to some excited state, what happens afterwards? So there's one thing that's called internal conversion. That means you go from a higher uh, lying singlet state, for example, to a lower lying singlet state without emitting radiation. Um, this is usually a very fast process. So, the, the time scale picoseconds, uh, what is causing the transition is the nuclear displacement. Uh, the sort of perturbation operator here is um, the, the nabla of the uh, nuclear position. And this is very effective for small energy differences, right? So there, there is a very strong and very fast transition from close lying singlet states, for example, from one to another. And at the end of the day, you end up after a very short time in the lowest singlet state. Here, then, is a big energy gap between S1 and S2, typically a small energy gap. And therefore, here, the system stays until different things happen. For example, you could have fluorescence, that means you have radiate, uh, decay with radiation from this excited state to the ground state, or you can have inter-system crossing, that means you can go from a singlet state to a triplet state, but this involves a spin flip, and it's typically only possible in the presence of, of heavy elements or, or benches. Right? So this is a general picture of uh, light excitation and uh, the processes that happen after the excitation. And so the Kasha rule is simply saying, well, this de excitation is typically so fast that you see fluorescent only from the S1, and you don't have de excitation from a hot state to the ground state typically. Okay, good. Now I come to the methods that we can use to, uh, to really calculate uh, these excited states, um, and especially, of course, time dependent density function in theory. Um, it's of course not the only method to describe excited states, but in the materials community, I would say it's it's a method that is used uh, most often. Of course, you also have GW, Peters Athena equation, and so on. So you have more elaborate approaches in the chemistry community. You have a lot of other approaches, configuration interaction, couple cluster, and so on. But the the ratio of uh, accuracy to computational cost is really very good with TDTFT, and therefore quite often it, this is the method that is used. It's not without alternative, but it also has problems. I will come to that, but uh, it's it's a good compromise, right? So what what's uh, it was actually formally developed in the 1980s uh, by uh, Eva Runge and uh, Hardy Gross uh, as an extension to conventional TFT. 
And um, well, it was used even before that, but then in the 80s, there was really the, uh, the, um, the big start of TDDFT. Um, and the idea is quite simple, right? So um, the key quantity of TDDFT is the density, the electron density, but this time, in contrast to conventional DFT, it's also dependent on time. And like in conventional DFT, you, you can write it as a, a set of single particle orbitals that also depend on time, on time of course. And these orbitals fulfill a, a time dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, so you go from conventional DFT to TD DFT just by going from conventional stationary Schrodinger equation to time dependent Schrodinger. That's the principal idea. And again, like in DFT, you have a potential here, the Kuhn-Charm potential. Uh, it's a local potential typically, so it depends only on R, not on R prime. It's a local potential um, and it can be written in the conventional form. So you have the external potential, that means the potential of the nuclei and also the potential due to a time-dependent electric field when you have the interaction with light. So here comes in the time dependence. So the external potential is time-dependent because of two things. First, because we have explicitly an external time-dependent potential in the electric field, but also it could be that your structure moves. No? When, your, when your atoms move, then you also have the time-dependent potential. Yeah? And, and this is included in this, in this term over here. Then we have the conventional Hartree potential that means the classical electrostatic interaction of an electron with the other electrons. So this is classical. And then we have the exchange correlation term. Um, that is a big problem. Um, because if you look at this equation, it looks very, very nice because uh, Hardy Gross was able to show that this density is the exact density of your many body system, although you solve or you only have single particle orbitals, right? So, this is a cone charm determinant of orbitals. And this, when you talk to a quantum chemist, you would say, Well, this is stupid, it cannot be correct because it's just one determinant. Where's the correlation? Uh, but Ramon and Cross were able to show that this is indeed the correct density if you have here the right potential. Right? So this is not the electrons moving in artificial potential. This is not the physical potential. This is an artificial potential such that the electron density is a true many body density. You have to get your head around this a bit. It's a bit strange. Okay, so what, what do we know about this term? Uh, can we use uh, a conventional functional like ADA for this term? Or do we need something fancy? Because at the end of the day, it's time dependent, you see? And um, here, the typical approximation is uh, that you do what's called the adiabatic approximation. You say, um, well, this is something that we want. And we get it by taking a conventional functional we, we have, like the ABA, like a GDA functional, PBE, for example. And then we replace the density in that functional by the, the real time dependent density at that point in time of the simulation. Okay, and then we can have, we have a working equation, right? So we have something that we can give to the computer and he gives us an answer. Because we can plug in ABA, GGA, whatever, right? Meta GGAs, you want, whatever you want. The, the, but it's important to realize that this is an approximation. The approximation is that, in principle, this potential could also depend on the density, not only at time t, but also could depend on former times as well. And this is what we would expect. In general, but right? physically, you would expect that, uh, that this potential depends also on former times. So, what we, we would call this this is local in time. We don't have memory effects in this, in this approximation. And uh, you will see that there are several problems due to this. 
where you don't expect them to arise. So you would expect this to be a bad approximation if you do some very quick uh, up to the second excitation of your system, right? But this is not the field where you really see the problem of approximation. It's, for example, in collective excitations, you see the problems of the other approximation also for charge transfer excitations. Then there is a second level of approximation, namely that even the ground state functional is not exact. So the ground state functional that you plug in here is also not exact. So for example, ADA for the ground state is simple, but it's, it's local in space, but it has a big problem that the Cochin potential is wrong uh, at, at large distance. So the, the ADA potential goes to zero too fast. And this leads to the fact that um, electrons are underbound. The, and this means that the ionization potential in conventional systems is uh, strongly underestimated. Okay. So already the ground state has some problems, and this is inherited by the excited state formalism. Okay, now, um, so why is it useful? First of all, it's useful because in conventional DFT, that's a variational method based, it's only valid for the ground state, and therefore uh, excited state is something that you do not easily get from ground state DFT. And TDDFT is the uh, approved solution, uh, I would say. There is a theorem telling you that TDDFT is in principle exact, so you have that. Um, and this is the approved solution for excited states in DFT. There are other ways, for example, the data SCF method is also present in DFT plus. Um, I cannot comment too much about that, but that's another way of going for excited states in DFT plus. It's called, uh, what is it called in DFT plus? Not data SCF, it's called Energy independent DFT, no, what's it called? Yeah. So there is a, yet another method to get excited states in DFT plus, which is not based on TDDFT. It's a different way. I will talk today about only about TDDFT. So, um, how do you solve that equation? Tomorrow, you will have uh, an introduction into the, really the numerical solution of that equation. Right? You really try to propagate orbitals in time. So you really, so you have your, 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 your orbitals at t equal to zero, for example, from a ground state calculation. And then you, you, you really propagate the orbitals in time. So you get the orbitals at time t plus delta t and so on and so on and so on. So numerical solution of that equation. That's a big advantage that it is in principle exact. And when it is exact, it means you can also treat strong, strong uh, electric fields because it's not based on perturbation theory. So you can follow electron dynamics in real time. You can study non elliptic effects with molecular electronics in time domain. So there are a lot of advantages that you have by doing the numerical solution. There are some disadvantages, and I will come to that later. The other way of solving that equation is by doing perturbation theory. So you assume that uh, the electric field that you apply is small. And that will give you rise to a couple of things. So you can then go to um, an eigenvalue equation. And that eigenvalue equation, as I will show you, will give you the excitation energies, the, the full UV visible spectrum forces in the excited state, and so on. You will get a lot of information about the excited state spectrum as well already in perturbation theory. And this is the part that I will focus on today. Well, let me go one step further and compare the two approaches. Because if you have both of these in DF3+, and sometimes you're not sure which one to take. And there are pros and cons to, to both of these methods. So let's first construct, um, look at the time domain. So really at the, at the, at the numerical solution of that equation, What's the big advantage? You can really do arbitrary strong fields. And you can also get an absorption spectrum, but you get the full absorption spectrum 
at once. You do only one trajectory, so you propagate the orbits in time for, say, 30 femtoseconds. And then you do only one Fourier transform, and you get the full spectrum with one, just one trajectory. It's very cost efficient. You only need the occupied orbitals because you only these construct the electron density, and you get all the information just from the occupied orbitals. So this is a numerical aspect, which is very important. But the disadvantage is that you get the spectrum, right? And then, but then you don't know what is this peak due to? What is the chemical nature of this excitation? You just get a peak. It's like you're an experimentalist. You do a spectrum and you get some peaks, but you don't know what, what, why is this peak this peak? And why is it there, not there? Right? You don't get insight into the spectrum by doing the calculation. It's just like an experiment. <coughs> the other disadvantage is, but you can get rid of that, but in the simplest approximation, you don't see the states that do not absorb. For example, when you go from a single, you start with a singlet state, and you do the spectrum calculation, you will never see triple states because they if you don't go from a single to a triple state. It's forbidden by uh, spin symmetry, as I discussed. So it doesn't show up in the spectrum, of course. And therefore, you cannot localize them. There are tricks to get that, but it's out of the box. It doesn't give you this information. Other big advantage this formula, this is formally m n to the power of 3, the computational time. That means if your system grows. Uh, with a factor n, then computation time grows cubic, but it can be made order n as well. So this is numerically the, the, the more advantageous approach. Okay, today I will talk about this approach. This is what I call perturbation theory before, but we can call this also frequency domain, TDDFT. And at the end of the day, what you have to do here, the, the, the time-dependent equation that I showed you before transforms into an eigenvalue problem. And you just have to solve an eigenvalue problem. And the, the excited state energies are simply these omega i here, the eigenvectors of this matrix. Actually, the square root of the eigen, uh, sorry, the square root of the eigenvalues of this matrix. These are the excited states. And um, the oscillator strength are obtained from the eigenvectors. Okay, so you get all the information about the spectrum from, from the solution of the eigenvalue equation. The big advantage of this approach versus this approach is you really get detailed information on the excited state. So you know exactly the electron goes from this part of the molecule to that part of the molecule in the excitation. Okay. You also can describe singlets and triplets, so you also can calculate the states that are not accessible from the ground state. But there's a price to pay. You have to consider both the occupied and the virtual orbitals in the construction of this matrix. And therefore, uh, this is formally n to the power of 6 CPU time. You never pay n to the power of 6, even up initial, you don't have n to the power of 6, but uh, this is much more expensive than this approach. It can be made cubic in DFTD plus. For TDDFTD, it can be made cubic, and you don't reach that normally for uh, TDDFT first principles. But if there are questions, please stop me and, and ask anytime you have questions about anything. Uh, now I come. Mm, and this will be important for the for the for the exercises as well. Uh, I will try to explain better what this equation looks like that we solved in the class. I told you uh, we have to diagonalize the matrix. It's this matrix over here. Mm -hmm. What are these indices? I, A, B, and so on. Uh, imagine you do a conventional DFT or DFTD calculation. And you will get a set of orbitals or bands from this EFT calculation. Some of the bands are occupied, some of the bands are unoccupied. Now, um, on the diagonal of this matrix here, it's simply uh, what in chemistry you call homo gap, 
in in physics language is the band gap. So it's simply the, the energy difference between uh, an unoccupied orbital and an occupied orbital. Here we call the occupied orbitals I and J and the unoccupied orbitals A and B, right? So on this diagonal, you have uh, this energy difference and also this energy difference for an excitation from this orbital to this orbital. And then you have an energy difference going from this orbital to that orbital as well. So all the energy differences are on the diagonal. But then there is, <coughs> that would be a terrible approximation. If, if we didn't have this term, that would be a terrible approximation because the Humo-Humo gap is typically not a good approximation to a single excitation energy. And also in solid state physics, you know that the band gap, and so that the, the fundamental band gap and the optical band gap are two different things. Okay. And this term corrects for that. So this is what we call the coupling matrix. And the coupling matrix is at the end of the day, it's a two electron integral. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but if you see at the end of the day, it's something like an electron hole interaction. It's not quite an electron hole interaction because this is an exchange integral and not a half integral. But anyway, it's an integral that in principle we can calculate. When we have the, the, the wave function, we can calculate this, uh, this integral, we put it here, then we diagonalize the matrix, we get the excited states. Very simple. How do we obtain these, these orbitals here, these states? First, we have to do a ground state calculation. So that's always the first step. We do a conventional ground state calculation. From this, you get the orbitals and you get these energy differences because you have also the, uh, the bone charm energy differences. That's TDD of T. In DFDD, there is one further layer of approximation. The first thing is obviously that these states are DFDD states. Okay. So the occupied and the virtual states come from DFDD. And the second thing is that we don't try to really do the integral. We make it a simple, we do a simple approximation. That is, what you see here is the overlap of two cone charm orbitals, an occupied one and an unoccupied one. And this density, which you can call a transition density, you can do a Mulliken approximation for the density. So you, you, you assume this density can be represented by a point charge. And this point charge is what we call transition charges. So they depend on the atom and they have an index I and A for a transition of an electron going from I to state A. And the remainder of the integral can be done in the same way as in conventional DFD with this gamma. Anyway, long story short, why is this approach pretty fast. It is fast because we never really do the two electron integrals. So we make it much simpler. We, we calculate these charges and then we calculate very easily this coupling matrix and then we get the correction to the homo gap. Yeah. Is it good enough, this method? Uh, well, this is, this is, uh, depends on your point of view, I would say. Um, maybe first I should try to uh, explain uh, why, why this coupling correction is really uh, very important. For example, when we look at ethylene, this very simple molecule, and you look for the singlet, singlet excitation, the first one, which is a five by star transition, then without the coupling matrix contribution, we would have this humo gap, and the experimental value is much larger. But if you do the correction with the coupling matrix, then you arrive at something that is much better. However, there are also problematic cases, for example, propunal, propunal, you see there is no difference, so the coupling matrix doesn't do anything. And why is that? The reason is the transition charges are zero in this case. Uh, when you look at this example, so when you have a pi pi star transition, then you can represent these lobes here uh, with transition charges that are non-zero for propinal that's different. Uh, there you have a um, uh, you have an, 
n to pi star transition, and there these, uh, these uh, charges are exactly zero, and our approximation to the full coupling matrix is not working. But we, uh, we have uh, extended this method recently such that you also get um, a correction for these transitions where the transition charges are exactly, exactly zero. Um, this is so-called um, on-site correction and is available in DFD plus as well. But I will not talk about this much more. But otherwise, so is the accuracy good or bad in general? Well, it depends. If you do a first principle DFT calculation, let's say with NW chem or with Gaussian or whatever, and you use a very good basis set, then you get better results than this approach using a similar functional. Yeah? If you do a calculation with a bad basis set, up initial, you are much worse than, than DFTB, right? So this, this calculation is not only taking longer, it's also uh, has a much lower accuracy. So there you can really say TVD is a good alternative. And also with respect to uh, other semi-empirical methods that possibly you know Indo in the US uh, is also giving you excited states, but based on how we talk at the end of the day, you cannot really compete with uh, TVD. And also in terms of computational power, uh, this is a logarithmic scale. And here is compared TDDFTB with actually Gaussian calculations with a good basis set, uh, with a basis set that has roughly the same size as our basis set and with indo -S. And you see uh, this calculation is, is still way more expensive than TDDFTB and gives you worse results. So in that sense, you, you, I think it's a sweet spot of the method in general, DFTB is a sweet spot between accuracy and computational time. Of course, you can do much better, but you have to pay for it. Okay. Other numerical issues. Um, I said in the beginning, um, the CPU time that you need is n to the power of six for these kind of calculations. Why n to the power of six? Because the, the matrix that you construct has one index which is occupied, another index which, which is virtual. Uh, and then you have this, um, so the dimension is number of occupied times number of virtual states. So roughly n squared. And when you dynamize a matrix that is cubic scaling, so then you have n to the power of six. n to the power of two, two to the power of three is n to the power of six. We actually have n to the power of three. And why is that? Because our coupling matrix um, can be decomposed. So we have, in general, we have, we have to perform a matrix vector product for the diagonalization. And this matrix vector product can be uh, decomposed in several parts. So first, you have the test vector multiplying the transition charges, right? Then you multiply this with the gamma matrix, and then you multiply this again with the transition charges. So you uh, factorize the problem, and this is where you can go to n cubic scaling. And this is maybe also important for the code um, because there are two separate ways you can do these uh, TDD of TV calculations. You can either calculate these transition charges on the fly when you need them, or you can calculate them in advance and then store them. When you calculate them in advance, the advantage is that the calculation is much faster because you can just look up the, the calculated result. On the other hand, you need memory. Uh, this calculation would take much more memory because you have to store all the transition charges. So it's your choice to say, I want a fast calculation, which takes a lot of memory, or I, I would, would rather like to do a big system that I use, have to use less memory and I have to wait a little bit longer. So there is the option in the code to so-called cache the transition charges. And then the code uh, solves, an, at the end of the day, you, you diagnose a matrix by repeated 
multiplications of the matrix with the test vector. He used iterative eigen solvers of the Davidson type uh, to, to diagonalize the matrix. And there are also some consequences of this, which I would like to show in the examples. Okay. Other things, we also have forces in the excited state. That means you can, uh, you can optimize the structure in the excited state, which is useful in a couple of examples. Um, and the computational cost is really not more than a ground state calculation. Uh, this is because we really have analytical excited state gradients. We don't have numerical gradients, which would be much more expensive. So, uh, summarizing this part. Um, um, one question. Uh, I think you didn't mention how on a scale, because in the independent DFT, like the Gaussian or something like that, the computational cost of the calculation increases a lot as you demand more uh, states. Uh, here it happens the same. Like it will affect a lot to the time of the calculation to ask from 10, state, 10 states or 100 states? Um, in principle, it's the same, yes. So when you, um, when you uh, do a calculation and you request only the 10 lowest states, uh, then requesting uh, the 20 lowest states will typically not cost you twice, a little less than twice the amount of CPU time, right? And it's also, if you can, it's not always predictable because uh, it's an iterative eigen solver. Right, and sometimes you can increase the number of states you ask for by a large number because then a chunk of excited states which are very close together will fall into the window, and then the calculation is very quick. So it's not it's not linear. So you it's often try and error, right? So you have to increase the number and see how long it takes. And so then you cannot really make predictions very easily. So TDD FTB in DFT plus. Uh, so we can compute valence excited states. We cannot compute core excited states. As I mentioned, TFTB, there are simply no core electrons, so we cannot excite them. So you can do valence excited states of fairly large systems. Uh, you can get excitation energies, oscillator strengths, and so on. You can do singlet and triplet excitations, but also you can do open shell systems. So when, when the number of up electrons and down electrons in the system is not the same, that's not a problem. We also can do finite electronic temperature. So we can, but that's not really tested, right? So we, <laughs> <laughs> but that the system, you can do your own experiments, right? So it's, you can see the, how the gap changes when you increase the electronic temperature. That's interesting. Um, so the code works for this specific case, uh, but I will have a comment on this later on. Um, you can speed up the calculation by what's called response matrix reduction. What's that? In quantum chemistry, you have a lot of approaches which are called uh, active space complete active space and consistent field and so on. What does it mean, active space? It means uh, you have your occupied orbitals, you have your virtual orbitals, and you take into account not all available orbitals. You say, I want excitations or transitions only from a subset of the occupied and virtual space. So maybe only four occupied orbitals, four uh, unoccupied orbitals, and I consider all the transitions in this subspace. OK, uh, we have a similar thing. You can say, I want only um, uh, ex to include excitations up to a certain energy difference. So the single particle excitations that go into the coupling matrix are restricted. And in this way, you can um, reduce the size of the coupling matrix. And in this way, the, the diagonalization is much faster. Right? So this is a way of uh, reducing the computational time. You also can characterize the excited state wave function. So what we provide is the so-called uh, CI singles wave function of Casida, 
maybe I say something about this later. It's not really a wave function, it's, um, but it's useful. Um, I will come to that in a second when I show the examples. Uh, you also have excited state double moments, Mulliken charges in the excited state. You can do geometry relaxation and also MD in a specific excited state. So you can do one Oppenheimer molecular dynamic simulation in the S1, for example, if you want to do that. Uh, you also get vibration frequencies in the excited state. That's also uh, maybe useful. Okay, what are the limitations? Um, the first limitation is so called Rückwärts states. Uh, Rückwärts states are high lying, but typically high lying uh, excited states of a molecule which look like an atomic orbital like a very extended atomic orbit. Um, and to describe them, typically you need a very good basis set. If you don't have a good basis set, you cannot describe this very diffuse atomic orbital-like uh, good basis. But since we don't have a good basis, we cannot describe them. Okay, so good basis typically not very described, but they are only important for typically for small molecules. When, when, when you get to larger systems, rootback states are never really an issue. Right? So for the desired application area of the FDB plus, actually there's not really a problem because they never, never show up. Charge funds for excited states, I will talk about that later, uh, are a problem, but there is a solution in the FDB plus. Highly excited states, also a problem. Um, when you go to a state that is the S10, S12, whatever, right? So you, you pump in 10 EV of, uh, of energy. Of course, the excited state, very high excited states are not well described, simply because the basis set, again, is not adapted to give you that excited state. Right? So the, the typical application area of DFTD is the absorption spectrum in the UV visible, in the visible, okay? Up to the UV, but not to the very high UV, right? So the, the lower lying states are typically very well described, high lying excited states, very much of the One negative point limitation is there is no symmetry analysis. Uh, I don't know where you, if you're a chemist or a physicist, when you're a chemist, every quantum chemistry code knows symmetry, right? So quantum symmetry of a molecule, you either have to specify it or it tells you this molecule has this or that quantum symmetry. The advantage is that the code typically assigns a given excited state to a given, uh, to a given point group, right? So you, you say this state is, uh, 1v2 state, for example, okay? This information you typically get from, from other codes, not from the UTB plus, uh, because it doesn't analyze the symmetry of your, of your structure. And the motivation not showing this information is simply it's a lot of work to implement that. And, and second, um, not many users want that because they look at structures which are typically don't have symmetry, RC1, mm -hmm. right? Because you're looking at nanostructures, they rarely have symmetry. Okay. But nevertheless, it's a minor, it's a negative point. Um, this is maybe much more important. There is no parallelization. Okay. We have parts of the code are OMP parallel, but in practice, I think when you try, you will see there is not a huge improvement in CPU time. Okay. So the, the, the critical parts of the code are not parallelized. So I'm talking about TD, DFDB. DFDB in general is parallelized. The ground state is parallelized, but not the linear response part. Yes. Not the, yet. The <laughs> I guess so that it is parallelized. No, we are using RPAC. And RPAC, there is PAPAC, which doesn't really work. Okay. Uh, it is not maintained. So, uh, but you say it will be soon? Yes, definitely. Yes, good. But this is really, of course, it's a drawback, right? Um, and then another limitation could be, could be 
depending on your problem, the availability of proper Slater cluster files. Proper Slater cluster files are, for example, NEO, PVC, TOR, ALOR, the 3OB. These are proper Slater cluster files. <laughs> and why do I make the distinction between proper and improper Slater cluster files? <laughs> the thing is the following. Um, Maybe on Friday also, when we, we talk about parameterization, um, you will see that there are different schools in DFDB, how to make straight across the parts. One school is to stay as close as possible to the PDE reference, okay? Then there is a, another school of thought which say, I want to be as close as possible to the experiment, which are two <clears throat> mutually exclusive things <laughs> because for example when you look at the band gap in PBE it's much too small uh, experiment gives you much larger band gap so some people say well I, I don't care about PBE I fit to get back the experimental band gap but then this approach will not give you very nice results because it starts from the wrong starting point this is based to be close to PBE and we'll give you back in P, uh, so it will give you back PBE, right? It will give you something close to time dependent PBE, okay? If you like it or not. Uh, so it, it, it has the same problems as TD PBE, right? But you can rely on it in a sense. Mm -hmm. If you start with other Slater cluster files, which have been tuned to get you very good agreement with experiments then very likely, I don't know what, what happens, right? So it's not guaranteed that you will get reason out. So in that sense, I, I talk about proper and improper state of cluster files. Also, but now I go very deep into the construction of state of cluster files. There are various ways of constructing state of cluster files. One is called density superposition, another is called potential superposition. This works for density superposition and not for potential superposition. Okay, but these are very, if you're using these type of files, you, you are fine, right? Right. So this, this should work. These are all tested and work very well together with TDP. At the end of the day, you always have to do a validation. Uh, when you work with semi empirical methods, uh, <coughs> DFDB plus is an example of this. What you typically do is you, you try to do, you, you try to, You have a big system that you want to describe, but maybe you can uh, make a small model and do the small model with full DFT or even better, and then you compare to DFTB for the small model, and then you see if it matches or not. Same thing for uh, TDDFTB. There also you try to uh, find a representative small model system that you can do with TDDFT, and you compare, and then you see if it works or not. Right. So validation is always important. I think. Um, yes. About the symmetry stuff, how, therefore, how it would be like with generated states that are in the, that can be differentiated by symmetry only, like for the optimization of one of these states, if you cannot like restrict the symmetry, that will probably. Yeah. That, that would be, would be a problem, yes. Um, um, what you can do and what I will show the examples, uh, you can always look at the molecular orbitals that go, that, that are representative of the excited state. And in this way, you can do manually a symmetry analysis if you want, or you can, but you are true, you're right. When you, when you want to fix a certain symmetry and optimize only this, this excited state in that symmetry, this is not an option you have in DFT plus, no. And even looking at the state doesn't help you there. Yeah. yeah, because it would sham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. will not have to be. Okay. okay. So, any other questions about this theoretical part uh, before I come to the, uh, the examples? I have one question, but I'm not sure if it will completely relate what I just said. But when I think about uh, Hamiltonian with time dependence, uh, I recall Floke theory. And uh, but basically, for theory, theory, we take the time dependence in the potential vector inside the Hamiltonian, right? And uh, I'm wondering if we get the same kind of results with Floquet theory and TDDFT, and if yes, uh, how does it scale computationally? Um, 
So, well, there, there are approaches to try to use uh, Floquet theory inside of TDDFT, but then Floquet theory is really based on periodic time uh, modulation, which is not always the case in applications. When you have a laser, you don't have really periodic perturbation. Um, it's not an approach that is quite often used for key in TDDFT, I would say. And there, I couldn't say that it's, uh, from the computational point of view, it's faster or less fast. Uh, right. I think it is a different application of TDDFT, or different perturbations, right? And um, what the typical approach of, or, or task of getting excited states of whatever system, it's not, not used. So the two approaches that are very common are this uh, perturbation theory that's also called Casida approach in chemistry. The full time development that will be treated tomorrow that's called real time TDDFT normally. And then there is a third option that's called Sternheimer. That's the Sternheimer approach. That's even a different way of solving the equation. Uh, they all solve the same time dependent equation that I showed in the very beginning by different ways. Two, uh, the Sternheimer is in the frequency domain, the, the Casita is in the frequency domain, and the real time is in real time domain. Right? So it's, all three have their pros and cons. You cannot say one is better than the other. It's good to have both. Right? And that's why in DFTB plus we have, uh, we have the two approaches. 